คุณกล้าถ้าพร้อมเมื่อไหร่บอกนะครับใช่ครับอาจารย์สักสักสักสามนาทีนะครับอาจารย์ได้ครับได้ครับไม่เป็นไรก็ให้สัญญาณบอกมาเถอะครับได้ครับครับตอนนี้เราจะมีผู้ร่วมเข้ารับชมครับผ่านทางซูมสองส่วนนะครับผ่านทางซูมแล้วก็ผ่านทาง Facebook Live ของคณะแล้วก็ Facebook Live ของหลักสุขนะครับผมครับคงจะมีคนเข้ามาเรื่อยๆนะครับครับงั้นเชิญอาจารย์ได้เลยครับผมโอเคครับเริ่มเลยนะครับ Good morning สวัสดีครับ Welcome to Um, HLD Howdy talk uh, this morning. Uh, this is the um, 135th HLD talk program we organized thus far. It's about 14 years ago that we start this program. Um, I can remember it's uh, the first one about uh, was uh, on 13 August, the year 2008. It's quite. Um, quite some time, long time ago. Huh? Anyway, um, the topic of uh, discussion of uh, today, we will focus on how organizations and employees um, react, adapt, and um, change their lifestyle and their own um, kind of uh, management in line with uh, the changing situations that uh, we still uh, don't know um, the pattern of change that will lie ahead. Um, anyway, as we already realized that uh, COVID-19 pandemic has affected us tre tremendously um, in every aspect of our life, uh, in, particularly in um, um, health and in um, economics or business. Sorry, I, uh, there is a helicopter flying over my house. So. So that should so have a strange noise. Anyway, we don't know when COVID-19 will end. And we are in time of really uncertainties, as far as I can tell. Um, we don't know what our future is and what will lie ahead, especially um, this year and next year. So in this situation, I think um, it is good for us to to prepare ourselves to create a protection system or an immune system, so that we can we can have uh, um, we can manage our risk, we can um, we can find other options or other alternatives in our life to survive. Organizations also facing the same situation with us. Um, they have to find way out. They have to work hard, um, change the mindset change their business model or, and, and transform, so to speak, every, every aspect, every level of their organization in order to, to survive, um, to sustain. Uh, that's what we are now talking about. Um, today, I have with me the three young prospective scholars. Uh, they are PhD candidates in our School of Human Resource Development, ADIDA. Um, 
they will come, they will join, they will share with us their ideas on um, several angles or several perspectives on how organizations and, and employees or people in organization should react, should adapt you know, in order to be resilient. That's what I ask our um, topic of discussion um, today um, stand for. Um, let me introduce uh, each of them to you. I, um, I will start with the first one. Um, we have two ladies and uh, one gentleman here. Um, we'll start with Kunarisa Kubota. She, uh, she is a director of uh, uh, the global Kume system and company. Um, the second one, uh, uh, Minghui Chen, um, she's a Chinese customer manager at Landmark Hotel. And uh, the last person, Kun Egabut, Tang Shi Vin Satian, he is a crew, uh, crew uh, a KV crew in Thai Airways International. And he also is a part time lecturer at Kasem Bandit uh, University. Um, in order to not to waste your time, let me just um, ask um, our speakers to share um, his or her own idea with us. Let me begin with um, Kunarisa. Uh, Hi, everyone. <laughs> yes, uh, Kunarisa, please go on. You will talk about business resilient in tourism industry um, during COVID outbreak. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, Ka, please let me share my PowerPoint. Yep. We're looking to uh, hearing uh, from you. Okay, can everyone see my screen now? I do, I do. So um, as everyone, like we all experienced together since nine, um, 2019, the whole world was hit by COVID-19 outbreak and Thailand was um, severely impacted, particularly in the tourism industry. It has the worst impact out of all the industries. And um, COVID-19 crisis has created a major, actually major challenges for tourism throughout the world with the worst impact. And it has brought the tourist in industry such as like um, hotel, restaurant, transportation, medical service, and all the tourist attractions into um, tremendous uncertainty. And um, due to the travel restrictions brought by the Thai government, uh, as a response to COVID-19. Uh, this has led to a significant drop of um, foreign tourists and also um, which led to a shrink in GDP by 5%, particularly in the tourism sector. And this actually makes up up to 15% of Thailand GDP last year. And developing economies which are heavily depending on tourism are um, like for example, Thailand, Indonesia have actually the worst impact out of this. So um, during COVID-19 outbreak, um, a lot of organizations were facing crisis. So if we talk about organizational crisis, it means that there are high level, levels of uncertainty, important issues and time of urgency. Also like at, uh, during the crisis time, the, there's low profit, profit, profitability and also like high impact event that threaten the viability of the organization. So during the crisis time, the response time is limited and also like like in many times, there are many choices to be made in the decision making, and um, there were a lot of disturbances to, on an organization's daily routines. For example, like um, manpower planning and cost cutting, because like some of the employees may have to, um, you know, work from home. So daily routines, decisions have to be made, and it, this can intimidate um, the core values and cultures of the organization. So the core concept in response to organizational crisis is the word business resilience. It means that um, the capacity to withstand the turbulence and bounce back, ability to bounce back from disruptions to its uh, normal state and the ability to rebuilding the markets and also like um, the business model changes significantly. For example, um, a change in process, maybe there could be a new business model or even new innovation which came out of the crisis. 
So um, last year, um, in in twenty twenty one, I I was I got really interested in this phenomenon. So, uh, based on a research question of how do business owners or top executives working in organizations related to tourism industry in Thailand survive the organizational crisis impacted by COVID um, nineteen outbreak? So I interviewed six business owners from various sectors in tourism industry. Um, such as like, um, sorry, I had a wrong spelling, but it's tr transportation, uh, like Chao Phaya Boat Express and medical service. They normally um, a service to expat tourists that come in and um, use our medical service restaurants and hotels. So like these are example quotes from the participants that that who I interviewed. So they say like, it, it felt like a bad dream that you know, they want to wake up from it. And it's as if um, planet Earth got attacked by aliens, you know, from Mars. So the situation was, as, as, as everyone know, that it was really terrible. So um, the main findings uh, were two, two key main findings were that um, business owner, psychological capital, and also key actions taken during the outbreak. That's you know, are uh, the, the key um, success factors of how the, they survive and bounce back to its no, normality state. So um, talking about psychological capital um, during crisis, it's um, an important component in human being. It relates to oneself's ability to be on real islands in order to improve and it is reflected by hope, resilience and also optimism. So leaders who have higher level of um, psychap will be able to handle adversities crisis brings in and the value that goes um, can be achieved even with problems. So after interviewing six business owners, I found that all of them have, have similarities in terms of positive psychological capital. So these are the components in um, psychological capital of business owners. They have hope resilience and optimism hope is um, they have the perseverance to accomplish the objectives and resilience is the cognitive ability to bounce back from adversities and optimism is the positive mindset regarding the success. So as a resilient individual, they will um, perform positive adaptive behaviors as well. And someone who is always keep looking for um, improvement in order to achieve goals when encounter with um, difficult challenges. So like one of the participants say that, you know, they would do everything in, in their power to actually survive. So key actions that um, were taken during the COVID-19 outbreak were higher involvement of management and restructuring of the organization chart. So um, this is to support higher flexibility and to take more control, teamwork, and also like more collaboration within team. The action in response to this is to um, restructure to the organization chart to be more horizon instead of the vertical. So like everyone is kind of, you know, bring bring on board more. So um, let's say more horizon, horizontal organization chart versus the silo one. And the next, next one, I would call it like the art of communication. I use the word art because, you know, they to do to be able to communicate with employees during um, crisis time, you need you need to know the right timing, you need you need to know your content well, what to communicate. And communication is one of the most impo important um, trade for crisis leaders, which, um, you know, how to manage such a difficult time and the content, you know, to communicate with employees in the organization, it has to be transparent. So like, um, for example, one of the participants say that, you know, you can't just inform them everything all the time. Uh, there has to be a transparency because you're asking, you know, employee, for example, for salary reduction, and there has to be fairness across the organization and the police policy has to be uh, fairly announced. And adaptive behavior is like uh, when, when someone is being flexible and receptive to change and to uncertainty because um, during COVID outbreak, trends change all the time, just like the COVID situation. So 
business owners and um, leaders in the organization as as well as employees they have to you know be be adaptive to change because things keep changing all the time also it's un it was unpredictable and i think this is very important that uh, being objective and by using scenario planning because it I think it's a very um, effective tool during crisis by using scenario planning. Uh, during that time, the income was really unpredictable. So it's important to plan ahead, like what strategies and action the organization can take according to the expected income. And even like, or oh, what would happen if the income is zero? Like what would be your strategies you know, to take? So um, these are uh, actually the new creations out of uh, crisis for each sector in the tourism industry. So for example, hotel, <clears throat> there's the alternative state quarantine, ASQ. So they change their business model into ASQ instead. And for restaurant, many restaurants create new cloud kitchen and even new sub brand. Uh, so when customers cannot come in to dine in that the, the restaurant, they have to be uh, adaptive and change their business model to rely more on delivery. So to create new cloud kitchen, they have to do it, uh, take action quickly and sub brand maybe like um, to buy one, get one free uh, and also like new delivery platform. And for transportation, uh, most of these transportation like um, JPR, River Express, they rely on uh, tourists. But since tourists cannot could not come in into Thailand anymore, they have to switch to Thai consumers. So it's adding new consumer segmentation and new online application for customer support and medical concierge service, or they also have to add and switch to Thai consumer as well. So HR roles and practices in, in my opinion. So knowing that today's position are not as um, stable as they once were, and therefore the importance, you know, that you, are, you have to look for employees who are flexible, who can learn and develop new skills and ex expertise. So um, for example, you may uh, have to look for someone who can be able to accept working or, you know, shift during weekend because in, in the past, some people may say like, oh, I will not take or accept calls during weekend. But when, when time, this, when crisis happen and you, you really need someone who's, who's flexible and HRD can contribute through sense-making communications in order to create um, psychological safety, uh, trust, job security through their emotional stability, uh, stability. Psychological safety actually decreases perceived in interpersonal risk and mitigates barriers to, to transform in the organization. So it's in, very important that you know, HRD help to contribute trust within team. And um, since technology has the potential to transform work and organizations these days, I think HRD can support employees' use of technology in order to um, continue learning and innovation as well as uh, organizational financial well-being and resilience. Also, um, workshop for job design and HRD practic practitioners can help employees to find meaning in their work and redesign their jobs to in a way that align with overall organizational adjusted goals after the COVID-19 organized some organizations may change their you know directions and goals and there has to be a um, new job redesign and I think it's important that HRD should foster learning culture to better cope with organizational change because um, even though like the situation get it get better but um, everyone is still um, you know, uncertain about feeling uncertain about the situation, whether there's going to be another lockdown and you know what would happen. So this all affect the emotional stability in terms of the job security and you know their future career. Thank you. Thank you, Kunarisa. 
um, for the kind of first round of uh, presenting your the whole idea on how to be how to become how to adapt how to react uh, productively to the um, impact of COVID-19 and particularly you discuss about the role of the leadership or leaders um, which I understand that we, we are talking about leaders at all level right um, not only at the um, echelon or at, not only at the broad loop. Well, um, listening to what you just said uh, reminds me of uh, something that I just discussed with uh, my friends in business uh, last week. Um, they are now quite worried about how, how to, to create agility in their organizations. I asked him, what do you mean by agility? He said he expects that his people will, would, would be able, good enough to dealing with complexities, dealing with something unknown, dealing with unexpected uh, demands of customers or, or think something, something new, try something on. In other words, in our academic uh, term, he's, what he's saying is he's saying that he, he needs his people to ha have what we call um, growth mindset, right? Um, you have to, you have something, uh, you have to work something, trying to um, reduce uh, the, restructure the process of your work, um, repackaging your products or your service to the, um, to the people. And especially uh, when you talk about leadership, he, he, he mentioned about the um, supervisor, supervisory or super, supervision or supervisor level. He's saying that um, he needs uh, his uh, people at the um, at the supervisory level or supervision level, um, be more of a kind of a, to be good role model leaders for for people at work, um, so that uh, leaders can understand um, employees uh, his his of their, his or her own people needs and react productively not to have to wait until um, uh, the kind of a CEOs or um, managing directors have to come down to solve problems for them. Okay, okay. Um, there will be some more on if I uh, continue my discussion with you. Again, <laughs> I'd just like to wrap it up a little bit for our audience to get some points so that they will ask you later on, okay? Now we can have uh, questions and uh, some insights or perspective on that. Okay, uh, we'll leave Kunariza here for a moment and we turn to um, Kun Minghui. Yeah, she would uh, discuss something about um, work from home mother, about informal learning, which is quite challenging. How we have informal learning at home effectiveness from the perspective of mothers themselves and from the perspective of the organizations. Mingwe, uh, please um, uh, have your time. Go on. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for Good morning. sharing your time with us. Um, let me just put on the PowerPoint. Uh -huh. Can you see the slides? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so I will take the time. Um, today, my topic is about the informal learning and mainly in the focus of the home-based mothers in a time of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, if I may remind, all of us that exactly the same time two years ago, it was the 20th of January, 2020, that uh, China officially reported to the World Health Organization about the coronavirus mm -hmm. break in China. And one day later, the WHO has um, notified the whole world about what's going on. And at the same time, Thailand as one of the four countries that has uh, discovered the positive cases has reported to the world that we've got a positive case. And ever since then, just like the, a lot of the researchers um, has written that suddenly everything has changed. The challenge of the COVID-19 pandemic, as we have seen that it has gone far beyond just the medical or economy um, area. We, as individual, as the citizen of the of the world, of the com of the company, of of the whole society, we have been noticing that we're not just 
we're we're not just individuals anymore. And because we're also, as it's saying that we're both a part of the problem and also a part of the solution. So we're experiencing physical distancing at the same time, the challenge of the social solidarity. So we're all trying to balance our life out. And like never before, we were required to understand many new things. For example, immune infections, resistance, vulner vulnerability, all of these things, even microbiology, who would think that this will become our daily topic? So we have been overwhelmed and overshadowed with what is unknown over our on already known knowledge. We're challenged. Um, from the report of McKinsey, that we can see that they this is the report from 2020, so it's a bit late now. Uh, what they said is that the future work, even in 2020, it has been brought to the present. What I was saying is that COVID-19 has accelerated everything, accelerated especially the technology development. We have experience in it. We have been doing this on a site, on, on a on internet. Everything has been trans transparent. Everything has been doing faster than before because we can do it from home, from internet. And employees, organizations, even the nationwide has responding to this crisis in redesigning the whole system. So the system has changed. Our life has changed. Everything's digitalized. And we have been practicing the flexible work arrangement, which mainly in the way of the remote working. And it has brought a lot of um, effects, uh, impacts to our daily life, both, both pros and cons. From the pros, we can see that um, we have been, been getting better flexibility in meeting both the combination of the running a family. Also, um, we can have the career at the same time with the lower cost of work. And however, the disadvantages have come along. For example, we have a higher anxiety of the daily life. We're facing a burnout. And a lot of people are facing a physical health problem and physical problem. And, um, at the same time, we, we've been, if I take the look on the group of women, even though a work-life balance is not a new topic, it has always been there throughout all of the industries. And it has been impacting us since there's working mothers or a working with women. Um, however, COVID-19 did bring unique problems to this group of people. And for example, take academic mothers, for example, in this report it says that this uh, paper research it says that during COVID-19 pandemic remote working becomes this 24 hours a day and seven days a week in company with children and other family members and academic mothers are multitasking constantly through switching back and forth between cooking cleaning writing papers teaching leading meetings homeschooling and changing diapers does that sound familiar to any of you so even you don't have to change diapers, we, we might notice that we have to switch back and forth from working and maybe cooking or something. So home-based mothers in my, um, in my research, I, I've, I've been including both of the group of people that as full-time mothers and working mothers. So full-time mothers are mainly refers to the ones that has forego their formal or regular paid jobs and staying home mainly for caring for their preschool children. And then for the working mothers, we know that they have the both identity of worker and mothers. So mothering, like we have uh, seen from a lot of um, ideologies, is just that it's a particular when children are young, it's a full-time job. Full-time job, we mean that it's a both um, labor intensive and mental intensive and emotional cons um, it's very absorbing. And working uh, laborers or working mothers are just like all other uh, workers. It's, it takes the same identity, but it takes both of the identity at the same time. And uh, let's take a look at the fe female labor participation in general. So it has been dropping for the female labor participation rate from 1989 to 2018. The rate has been dropping from 51.3 to 
8.5, and it was uh, pr predicted an even lower rate on 2030 at the at the number of 45.9. So female labor participation rate has been dramatically decreasing. And it was in another report uh, from UN Women, it says that prior, prime working age women are less likely to be in um, participation of the laborers because uh, especially when they're living with a household of extended family with young children. And more other books, for example, Ming Yin, which is written by the CEO of Facebook, Sherish Sandberg, is saying that 43% of highly qualified women with children are leaving the careers or off-ramping from the period of time. And how, however, uh, among all of these women, 43% of the women, they have the high intention to return to the workforce. How about in the female labor participation in the time of COVID-19? We've been saying that more women, one in four women, are considering downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce. If anyone has the experience of caring for the schooling um, age to children during the COVID time, may have the same consideration because of the online learning system. Like all of the children, if they have to learn at home, we have to we have to really manage the time with the children and also set the space and set everything ready for it. It's not a um, once for all sort of job, it's an everyday job. Therefore, many many women are facing the same problem and considering leaving the job or workforce. And also a special situation of our COVID-19 has brought challenges for women in healthcare um, industry, in the service industry, education industry who are featured a high female employment rate. And because of the online learning, it has increased the needs for child care at home. And especially with all of these women with increased workload and increased child care um, stress, they have been facing a lot of unique difficulties. And a report from a, a research from a Chinese researcher, Xiao, and says that um, a lot of people are facing decreased physical and mental well-being after working from home. So uh, the number we can see from the slides is 4.8% of respond, uh, respondents reported new physical problem, 736 has re, um, reported mental issues. And why we talk about informal learning? So I'm, if I may, I may um, jump to the the 19th, a little history about the education and learning um, revolution. So ever since the globalization and ever-changing modern market has been impacting everyone, um, the concept of, ed of education has, has been changing and evolving. It's been changing from something more stable and more institutionalized sort of education, which one can acquire once and for all, have been shifting to something more fluid that has been passed to be renewed over and over again in an even faster and faster speed. And also, um, Robert Kagan and Lisa uh, Leahy has understand that the learning needs, what they say is that are located in a com context of increasing complexity in both both, both in terms of the level of knowledge available and in terms of the mental system required to deal with a more complex knowledge, which is like the demand and the supply of knowledge are both increasing, then the learning needs are also increased. So at this time, the COVID-19 has increased both of these needs. What we, we are facing is now that we, we need to update our com competency to deal with our or both life and work. And then we can see that learning is not just a co cognitive matter, but also the total personal development of capacities relating to all functions and spheres of human life. And there are some more, talk, uh, more areas of the uh, informal learning. It says that why we have to take the form of informal learning because we simply just don't have the time to enroll in the formal classes in our everyday life or every new stage of life. We can just go to the school and learn it and come back to leave. It's like we can learn and swim um, just by, you know, before we 
we need to go into the school and then come back and then swim. We have to do it at the same time as in the water. So if we're living in a learning society, much of this learning is related to unpaid work. And also the benefits of such a learning remains almost completely unforeseen. So uh, a, a learning expert, Illuris, says that the fundamental primary function of learning is one of the most basic abilities and manifestations of human life. Now, um, learning has become even more important than ever. And talking about learning, uh, informal learning, we need to see the structure of learning. Um, in the Livingstone's research, that he's um, identified the different research of learning by priests to two kinds. One is the pre-established one and one is situational one. And we can see that informal learning or informal, informal education mostly um, located at the situational learning part. However, we can also notice that a pre-established body of knowledge and experiential learning are sometimes they happen together at the same time. Therefore, the identity of the learners and teachers and it is also interchangeable. So it's very hard to identify what exactly a informal learning is. So therefore, Livingstone has given this definition. It says that any activity involves the pursuit of understanding, knowledge, or skill, which occurs without the precedence of external imposed uh, curricular criteria. And it includes both self-directed, collective, collective informal learning and informal education and training. At the same time, learners and teachers are often interchangeable. So why is informal learning tended to be ignored and devalued um, by dominant authorities and researchers? Um, not many people notice uh, has been paying attention to informal learning when it's compared to formal learnings or educations. And one of the most important reasons is that it is difficult to measure and clarify, uh, certify. And also the knowledge and skills are more tested and granted in experience, which tend to be more relevant to the, subord the subordinate of social groups. So mostly at the lower rank of the social groups are, are more relevant to the informal learning in some cases. And um, there are some other definitions of informal learning and the survey, this is the one of survey I, I thought is very interesting, even though it was taken place in 1998. However, I think these questions we can still asking ourselves. If someone come to you with this survey, would you answer this question? Like, have you been undertaking any uh, of the activities activities like this for reading a book or watching a TV program or doing some online courses on the internet? What were you learning? These questions, may, you may take the time to do it um, uh, when you are uh, with yourself. And uh, during this research, I've been taking the keywords I did for the literature research are uh, among the informal learnings, learnings, transformative learnings, and also partic labor participation, COVID-19, and uh, came up with the, um, the discussion like I just did. And so we come to the implications for practice. So we've been seeing a lot more informal learning practice in, in our daily life. For example, in the US, the governor of, of the state of New Jersey has signed the legislation lately to provide new mothers with physical and mental health wellness checks. And they have all of those uh, um, so breastfeeding support programs or the family planning, child, children planning programs. All of these are in taken the form of inform, inform, inform uh, forms. And then the, as we are living our lives with the digitalization, we can see that we've been doing a lot of informal learning in the form of the, in the digital content markets. For example, the podcast, and have you been listening to all of the audio books? If you do, then you've been taking informal learnings. And then for the implications for the future research, um, aside from, aside from the um, both empirical or qualitative researches, I also think that as I've been gradually doing more literary research uh, reviews, 
I have an intention to combine vocal learning with transformative learning together. As uh, Ilaris has stated that transformative learning is a significant concept in terms of uh, broadening the understanding scope of human learning. And it is very important to combine transformative learning with other learning conceptions to achieve a complete understanding of what is happening and what is possible. So uh, my conclusion is that I think home-based mothers has been, can be a potential growth point for the women employment. And then as in terms of informal learning, I read this very important, uh, very interesting discussion. It says that learning, especially informal one, is like the car light. When, if you have been dri driving a car in the in a nighttime, you may see that a car light might be able to just cover the range of 100 meter or 200 meters of the range. It, it cannot cover the whole whole darkness in front of you. However, with a car light, it's just like the informal learning. You can you can drive for millions of miles. So embrace the learning informally. Thank you, for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Minghui. Quite interesting presentation, uh, indeed. Um, you mentioned several uh, interesting concepts along the line of uh, uh, your speak. Um, at first, I thought that uh, um, you will mention about the well-being and of, of women or mothers, and then uh, you cover that already, um, which is quite uh, a, a, a leading uh, concern of many people in organizations now, because they have to do what we call hybrid working or kind of remote working. Um, and um, many organizations now busy, really, really busy on to reschedule um, work schedule of uh, their employees. They have to taking turn, they have to um, work um, among themselves week by week so that they can find a work-life balance, uh, which is uh, quite important for attracting people of giving good experience of, uh, to employees now. Um, you also mentioned that something that I think later on we will discuss more on um, that you desire to add on what you call informal learning, which is itself really interesting with the what you call transformative learning okay these two terms somehow a little bit overlap okay there should be some kind of a connection or linkages among um, these two these two concepts or, 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 or activities that are really important especially in time of uh, we have to work from home and in uh, from the situation of, uh, of what you call the home-based mothers right um, full-time mother working mother um, and especially academic mothers, so that you have to do several things. I um, I understand your situation now, Minghui, and I, I also that our audience who are in the same situation as Minghui, who share the same feeling it, as well. Um, one thing that um, you may add on later on, later the second round of presentation, if you can, um, people concern about what we call performance management. Um, how do we um, how do we um, make sure that uh, people in our organization have the same goal, um, agree on the um, work schedule, agree on the um, workable KPI, and we have a kind of a, a interactive uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation of our performance, okay? Uh, because um, uh, since we're now working uh, at home, um, the conventional um, performance management system somehow is shaky. Um, they, we should uh, kind of design a PMS system as a tool and as a process so that uh, people in the organization can work together uh, uh, during this crisis and, and make the organization productive and also make um, employees happy at, at work. Okay, if you have time, uh, we'll come back and please mention all this too. Uh, in, from the perspective of informal learning and, 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 and home-based mothers, okay? Now, I think um, we should turn to our um, another uh, speaker, the last person, a gentleman, Kun Egebut. Okay, Kun Egebut will share with us um, what, what I, I think what most of, uh, most employees now are concerned themselves, how they can keep their work, how they can keep their jobs, right? How can we make uh, their work productive so that 
they can be a, 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 a kind of a, a positive or kind of a, 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 a con make a good contribution to their organizations. So mm -hmm. Kunekabut, please share with us your idea on um, the topic of uh, the, the um, career resilience, please. Um, we cannot yes. hear. Yeah, okay. We okay. can. Okay. Yeah, um, just a minute. Let me share my screen. Okay, please. Wait a moment. Let's see. No problem. Take your time. Okay. Now can we... you see my screen? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. Yes. Um, Good morning, everyone. My topic is the um, the role of HRD for the career resilience and career sustain, uh, sustainability after COVID-19. So um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been widely determined to be both a health and um, economic crisis with updates of progression addressing losses of lives and jobs. And as countries and organizations begin their evolution from initial reactive surprise at the scope and depth of the crisis to strategy for recovery, opportunity arise for change. So McKinsey Institute, which tracks global economic trends, suggests that COVID-19 has moved the conversation about the future of work into the present, underlying the need for a long-term perspective that does not just rebuild from past model, but develops strategy that creates resilience for future career, or for future crisis. And at this point, there is much we do not know about our future following COVID-19, but we can expect change in how, where, and even when work is accomplished. <clears throat> so, um, how will the coronavirus experience affect the future of the career? For example, for the, uh, for the question, will there be a rush of people choosing to be a healthcare provider, or will more students seek careers in biological science or pharmaceuticals to create medical tests or vaccine for the future pandemic, or the most um, shocking one is, will the rise of online learning reduce the need for the teachers. And while we do not know what types of job will thrive, survive or become obsolete, we can speculate on what we might expect from a recovery by observing data and trends. And early adaptations for returning to work sites have revealed changes in facilities and interaction patterns for service as well as manufacturing sector jobs. Workplaces are revamping interiors into uh, accommodate social distancing, even when working directly with the public as part of the job. And after years of the studies proposing flexi time and working from home options, uh, the pandemic reinforced that some jobs can be done at home and that people can meet online more cost effectively and safely than traveling to other parts of the country or world knowing that it is likely telecommunication for all or part of the work week will continue for safety, convenience, and financial savings. The increasing interface of work and technology will include automation as organizations seek options that would let them remain productive when the next pandemic strikes. A renewed push to automate will have short and long-term consequences for the future of work and the economic security of the workers. And the pandemic has and will continue to impact careers. Fortunately, many career scholars and practitioners have recognized this chaos that has surrounded careers for the past 35 years. So there is a body of literature that may help as we, <clears throat> as we work to navigate post-pandemic work using uh, research about career resilience and sustainable careers. This presentation aims to discuss how individuals and organizations might evolve as they adapt to this new world of work, 
implications for HRD will be addressed, uh, will be addressed as well. Career resilience has been defined in a variety of ways with scholars often debating whether, oh, Hola, mis híbrido gang. Los quiero. What happened? What happened? Right. Besos y abrazos a la distancia para todos ustedes. What happened? Yeah. Um, what, um, what happened? At, uh, should be some uh, interference from somewhere. Okay. Kunkao or Kun Wanvisa, are you here? Are you on the um, meter? Um, yeah. Have, yeah, what, what happened, Kunkao? It should, uh, can, you, can you make a kind of five or four? Yes, yes, yes. Or you bring that into field with her? Please. No, that's all right. It should be okay now. Um, Kunikabut, let's okay. continue. Let's continue. Okay. All right, can you see my screen? Um, Please go ahead. Yeah, just a moment. Okay. Oh, what happened to my computers? Oh. Just, just a few minutes, I, I'll, I'll fix it. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. You can, uh, you can move your slides. Yes. Um, mm. okay. So um, yeah, let me start this um, uh, slide again. The career resilience have been uh, have been defined a variety of ways, where scholars often um, debating whether it is a trade capacity, a process. <clears throat> Yet um, the most recognized one it is about adapting and persisting when faced with the disruptions or adversity, and acknowledge it is. Okay. Uh, it is important in considering careers in today's turbulent economic environment. So resilient as a topic of the conversation or as a research focus has been prevalent in recent years due to a variety of contextual factors. For example, the rise of job insecurity and precarious work, the intensification of work, the blurring of work, non-work non boundaries, work-life conflicts, and almost daily, we hear stories about how individual resilience has been tested or how individuals have um, demonstrated resilience due to the disease, whether it is um, people navigating remote work, frontline employees risking their lives by continuing to do their job in close contact with others, or those facing employment. Resilience and work are an um, important part of the coronavirus conversation. Most of the study have focused on um, career resilience, recognize that both individual and contextual factors influence one's career resilience. Individual characterist, uh, uh, characteristics such as traits, skills, and attitudes and behavior have been found to positively and negatively impact one's resilience. Contextual factors such as supportive workplaces, job characteristics, and supportive family also are important influence of career resilience. These individual and contextual factors 
are also um, important in career resilience. <clears throat> so a lack of resources such as material, human capital, social support, put individuals at risk and, <clears throat> and can negatively influence their ability to be resilient. Whereas correct, uh, proactive factors such as um, strong uh, social support, variety of skill can lead to positive outcomes. So while the value of the career resilience is clear, one of the major criticism of the push to encourage employee resilience is the focus on changing the individual rather than changing the environment, which often is the root cause of the problem. And for the sustainable and post-pandemic career, operationally, this means that sustainable careers encompass the entire lifespan, incorporate, uh, incorporating the past, investing the present, and innovating for the future, including paid and unpaid work. They recognize the uh, intersection of multiple life contexts, including social, work, and family, and accommodating the needs of each. <clears throat> Finally, they are guided by individually craft career decisions that value many as well as employability. And key to this concept, uh, key to this concept is a further acknowledgement of the shared responsibility between individuals and organization, uh, organizations that employ them. Why not created for this um, pandemic era? These elements fit well as we investigate into the future of the career. And <clears throat> unintended benefits of the um, sheltering in place have included opportunity for reflection on work life, past, present, and future, perhaps recognizing career and personal goals. It has fostered a renewed uh, recognition of community interconnectivity highlighting the greater context in which we live, uh, we live and work and reinforce the links among work, social and family life on an unprecedented scale. As individuals and organizations move out of this first phase of the um, pandemic adaptation, all have been changed by the experience and that will be reflected in the way we think about and approach work going forward. A key aspect of building a sustainable post-coronavirus um, career will be learning from this experience and applying that knowledge. For individuals being in learning mode is a meta competency in the quest for career sustainability. The McKinsey Institute also suggested that successfully moving beyond this crisis will require innovation, learning, and adaptation. Another dimension to the sustainability connection to the, uh, connection to the post work post COVID work, suggesting additional layers of com uh, of complexity regarding how context influence the career decision making process. They asserted that individuals make career choice based on how they prioritize their needs in conjunction with the need of the communities and their organizations, and that priority may vary by career phase with the choice changing at different stages. Organizations invested in retaining talent and fostering a sustainable culture can assist in this process by offering support and exploring options to keep employees engaged and growing over time. <clears throat> As we move forward, there is an opportunity to create and reinforce sustainable workplaces that adhere to the triple, bo uh, tri triple bottom line of the profits, planet, and the people. This is a reset opportunity. Cognitive, uh, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, conversation of resource theory. <clears throat> uh, this theory was de uh, developed to explain what happens when individuals are confronted with the stress. According to the Hoffball, who invented this um, theory, people work to build and preserve resources such as objects, personal characteristics, conditions, energies, and we try to reduce, to lo and we try to re to reduce the loss of these resources when stress occurs. 
while many stress theories focus on the individual and how individual uh, respond and cope, COR theory emphasizes the importance of the environment in the stress process and how it can consume or enhance people resources. So the notion of building and conserving resources can explain and be helpful in developing resilient, uh, resilience and, sustain, and sustaining careers. However, what happens to draw it with, uh, with very few resources to draw, as Hopfall noted, uh, resources are not, uh, are not distributed equally and those people who lack resources are most vulnerable to additional losses. Additionally, he theorized that events can threaten one's resource capacity, and these events can pose greater problems for those, law, uh, for those less resource indoor members of economically developed nations and for underdeveloped and economically challenged nations. While growing divides between those that have and those that do not have worsen in the past few years, this event has made those divides worse. Inequalities among populations within countries, low income and margin, uh, marginalized individuals and, in, and inequalities between countries have become more pronounced due to the pandemic. So what can be done to ensure individuals have the resources and protective factors to help build their resilience to weather this crisis. This requires more than a single short-term solution, rather it involves uh, an, a sustained effort on the part of the organizations, governments, and, uh, and the um, co uh, communities to consider a variety of ways to help individuals build and retain resources. Assisted, uh, assisted approach that acknowledge the interconnectedness of the business, government, and society is necessary. The pandemic has reinforced this linkage, extending across boundaries and requiring, requiring efforts to work together or fail. Our recovery will require the same kind of commitment not to leave large segments of the society behind as we move, uh, as we move forward. Uh, this is the implications for the HRD practitioner. The first one, strategies to helping uh, individual within the organization. Specific psychological and behavioral uh, strategy individual can be used to, de to develop a growth mindset, reconsider and reframe career goals, seeking out training and development opportunities and build strong career networks. These, states, uh, these strategies are within the HRD professional uh, wheelhouse, indicating HRD can play an important role in helping individuals recover and sustain their career post COVID-19. It may involve <clears throat> providing training to assist employees in developing additional skills or to retool for, uh, uh, for other jobs, as well as helping individuals with their future career plans including exploration of realistic options that help build sustainable careers. While the ideas of the HRD practitioner being well-versed in their career guidance is not new, the process of reclaiming workplaces after pandemic will make career development an essential part of HRD for organizations interested in not just recovering, but in creating workplace that will be better prepared to address future disruptive events. A critical part of creating and sustaining a learning culture is recognize how differently, differently employees have experienced this crisis and what they might need to return to work and be successful. Treating each employee on an individual basis will be important because for some, <clears throat> this pandemic has not been a career shock but rather a minor distraction or an opportunity to spend more time with family. For others, all outward appearance might suggest it has had a little effect on their careers, but for a variety of reasons, such as fears, health concerns, impact on loved ones, that influence could be great. For many, this pandemic has and will continue to have uh, consequences 
regarding career plans and livelihood due to job elimination, drastic changes in how work gets done, and business chatter. Reaction may also differ depending on where people are in their lives. Choices, decisions, and strategies will vary whether individuals are in the early, mid, or later stages of this career of their careers. HRD needs to be aware of these differences in balance and individual responses to the crisis and work to help employees depending on their specific needs. Practitioners also can play a critical part in fostering employees' ability to recover resources and manage career shocks in the, in the role of the advocate. For the supporting within the organization and communities, there might be difficulty and risks for HRD, but supporting can be strategic and major. Working within the existing climate to lay the groundwork of assessing options and introducing ideas with mutual employee-employer benefits. As systems begin to ramp up work again, many already are considering protocols and processes, making this an ideal time for HRD to encourage, uh, encourage change. A timely target for HRD um, supporting could be a review of salary and health benefits disparities among employees. The pandemic has emphasized the growing global financial and resources gap. Even prior to this crisis, experts expressed concerns about risk expanding inequality post to overall economic growth and political stability. The pandemic includes job losses in the formal and formal economy and reports of slow recovery, with some jobs never returning have made this concern worse. This complex uh, issue plays out at smaller scale in many organizations where change could begin. Robust and accessible mental health services are another potential and supporting point as the pandemic recovery continues. HRD practitioner may find the literature on stress post-traumatic growth to be helpful as they prepare to lobby for additional mental health resources within their organizations, train, uh, train supervisors and managers to be more aware of mental health challenges and work with employees to ensure they are aware of these resources and how to access them. Organization, along with the government agency, can partner in developing innovative ways to help the most impact by um, COVID-19 F, uh, effort at the system level would be strengthened with additional HRD support for communities and governmental policy and practices that foster more uh, equitable pay structure and healthy workplaces. HRD can also exert influences on um, developing more human organizational cultures that foster a greater sense of altruism empathy and pro-social uh, pro values, enhancing so uh, societal well-being through one's, uh, one's work experience. The time is good to reinforce that approach in systems as company consider how to keep those working from home engaged, how to mass track or work schedule, or possibly how to implement uh, an approach to their workplace. HRD is well positioned to teach models and supporting for adopting um, values in the organization. For the last one is practicing self-care or self-supporting. Given the many responsibilities, of course, a pandemic workplace will be placed on practitioners. It will also be important for HRD professionals to engage in um, self-supporting why we believe HRD should be a value now more than ever, some practitioners may find themselves vulnerable to job loss or additional stress in their efforts to assist employees and their organizations in this complicated and difficult time. Building one's own resources to ensure resilience might include focusing on learning and expanding and enhancing personal skill sets seeking the support of others such as friends, family, colleague, uh, 
colleagues and online communities can help with the emotional and, so uh, and social needs, as well as with learning. Additionally, attending um, to one uh, physical and spiritual needs during this time can be helped with coping and the uh, burnout. To sum up this presentation, it is human nature to want to know to seek answer, even to look into the crystal ball for a quick look to the futures. Times of uncertainty increase uh, that need. COVID-19 has prompted a global sense of uncertainty, but the legacy remains to be seen. So what we know is the pandemic is still going on, but what is still unknown is the speed of the, of the recovery and how particular job sectors will be affected over time. The variables are too much in flux for definitive numbers at this point. Careers and work are always in the state of change where some jobs becoming obsolete and others emerging to meet the needs of each era. So um, while COVID-19 has been a painful experience and choice about the future of work into the prison can be recovered, but it will take time and efforts. Therefore, HRD, uh, HRD has an opportunity in this moment to play a significant role in helping individuals and organizations fighting and supporting resilience, replenish, uh, replenish reduce resources, and build more sustainable career cultures. Thank you for your um, kind attention. This is all for my presentation. Thank you very much, Kun Egabut. It's quite interesting presentation. Uh, I learned many things from you, especially um, I, the importance of uh, the job insecurity um, that I think of every employee is now concerned with himself or herself very really much. How long that they can keep the job in organizations, right? And you use yeah. a sustainable career. Okay, we not only talk about a, a single job, we talk about the whole our whole life long. How can we have a secure career or, or sustainable career or successful career, so to speak? This is a very pressing issue indeed in time of um, pandemic now and in the future. And, um, and as you just uh, share with us that, okay, for the organization, for the management, they have to do whatever can, they can to make the um, organization adapt and uh, survive or even sustain, okay? Uh, trying to achieve what they call inclusive growth. It means that it's a growing, that everyone, every stakeholder benefit from the growing or growth of the company or organization, okay? And from, from, the, from, the, from the part of in, employees, uh, you share with us that it's to, uh, in order to survive, in order to be secure in the, your job, you have to be become more innovative. You have to learn something new, just like Ning Hu is talk about informal learning. You have to do some uh, like uh, a kind of adaptive, maybe, um, flexible person adaptive. It means that not only reactive, but proactive, trying to find new opportunities, new ways of working or thinking and work together with other people. Uh, but lastly, that I, uh, you presented your presentation uh, make me worry. It's about the role of HR people, HR professionals. Uh, it's, a, it's a really a huge pressure on HR people now. How do they help their fellow employees uh, and help their management uh, to, 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 to pass through this time of turbulence, this time of difficulties, right? And, um, and, and, and listening to you, I realize that this is not the kind of uh, um, unfortunate or um, the bad bad luck for HR people, but I rather think it's a it's a new opportunity for HRD or HR people to do something something new, something more valuable, something more productive. Especially when you talk about the implication for HRD, um, not only helping individual um, employee but also. Um, create a kind of a, a learning ecosystem in organization, um, making a kind of a good um, culture, a new culture, a sense of empathy, um, help, helping each other and help and, and work together in the, along the line of uh, value chain. 
and 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 also organization have to have to what restructure or or, or redesign itself so that you, you can be a good place for that people um, can can share ideas and can work together uh, can uh, set up a new strong network or even bring in a new technologies to become more of meta meta metaverse uh, or meta organization so to speak okay i can go on on and on but uh, this is something that i can learn from you uh, listening to your presentation now we can have uh, questions coming up from our audience if uh, if uh, uh, please feel free uh, our audience um, and um, who are now with us online with zoom uh, if you have any questions comments please uh, feel free to um, to present or to write to our host but again while we're waiting for uh, questions and comments uh, let us uh, turn to um, um, Kunarisa again for a kind of a second round you may have something that you left over you or you like to, something that you like to uh, put more emphasis on or or you like to, to say something uh, more about the the, uh, the implications of your study in tourism industry on the HRD practitioners or HRD people? Um, I have nothing to add right now. Um, I have nothing to add right now, but uh, maybe like I can um, chime in when the, you know, all of us articulate ideas or questions. You think that in in uh, may I ask you um, on behalf of the audience, um, for you 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 tell us about what's happening in tourism industry, which is quite worrying, and uh, we need a new kind of a new business model on uh, tourism in Thailand or even in, in any country in the world now, and um, and people are now quite shaky though I mean in terms of uh, employment in uh, tourism industry, and for those um, who work as HR people. Uh, can you can you just uh, name or you just tell us that um, what would be kind of priorities that HR people in tourism industry should do at this moment? I think like um, priority in terms of HR, like as I mentioned just now about agility of the business, and I agree that I've seen um, a lot of um, business that has low agility. Mm -hmm. And when there has to be a strategies and um, any execution that has to be made, it's it's there's a, a lot of delay okay. in terms of um, actions that can be made because um, decisions has to be have to be made through many people. Okay. Oh, so, you mean you're saying that many many uh, tourist uh, um, companies still structure in a kind of a hierarchical structure, right? There are yeah. Many Kind of a, a, a two or three or four layers of uh, yes, but I think like business, many business in in <clears throat> not just in tourism, but a lot of business, you know, th there has to be a lot of hierarchy yeah. when yeah decisions have to be made. So I think like the priority is that HR has to uh, be the strategic partner with the you know the owners and um, with the top management and restructure the the organization chart and see like how can decisions can be made more quick because during crisis moving on forward you can't have a you can't have a delay yeah yeah, yeah. actions have to be taken quite quite quick and um i think another important thing is with the recruitment like what type of <clears throat> you know, the characteristic of your employees and expectation of the organization also from the employees mm -hmm. in terms of flexibility, working with the company. Because my, like, for example, my, uh, one of the participants say that, you know, they actually expect employees to work around the clock. I mean, it sounds unrealistic, but during crisis, it actually, it has to, it has to be that way. You have to be able to, you know, stand by and be ready, but but not 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 everyone. You know, like expect that. You know, I have to work around the clock. I have to answer the phone during the weekend. Mm. So there's, I think there's a gap in expectations between employer and employee. So as an HR, how can you close the gap between right. employer and employee yes. in terms of flexibility of you know the working time? 
most 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 owners I, I know would would expect that their employees to you know they 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 always complain that you know my my <clears throat> my um, employees complain yeah. that I call them on the weekend mm. but I also understand on the employee side that <clears throat> they don't want to work on the weekend well but in, during this time of uh, difficulty, <clears throat> everyone should understand what that uh, we are in the kind of a, uh, in the in the mad sea um, we have to help each other there's no time to rest right you know to survive uh, yes <clears throat> yes but on the, um, not everyone is on the same term and not everyone is on the same understanding um i think like the ownership of the business the feeling of the ownership of the of the business is also different Yes. between um, employer and also with the employee. So I think as an HR, um, I think we we really have to look into this and you know how 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 can we all work as a team and close the gap yeah. of this expectation. Because every all the business owners I know they all complain that you know my employees complain <laughs> when I call them on the weekend, but it's emergency, it's crisis things have to be done quickly and there's no weekend no weekday when we talk about survival of the business sometimes yeah. things cannot wait okay mm. um, do you think that uh, people at the what do you call middle level manager or the at the um, head of a section or the supervisor level it's important in how how good that the supervisor can react or can help or can make employees or their people understand of the urgency of the, of the company situation. Yes, that's why I, I mentioned in my presentation that it's about uh, the art of communication. It's not effectiveness anymore. It's like the art of communication, how you communicate, communicate and convey people to, to understand that we are all on the same board. It's mm -hmm. not you, it's not me, it's not is us together on the same boat. How can we con con uh, convey that message? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it's not about like putting burden on the employees <laughs> and uh, make them feel that, oh, I have to answer my call on the weekend. And is it uh, for, for those people who, who um, for those employees who seems to uh, not um, um, kind of not happy to work uh, during weekends, do you, do you think that the, the issue of generations is involved here? I mean, kind of young people, they more- Yes, I think it, it could be possible because like, um, I don't want to generalize, but- Okay, yeah, no, no, we, we don't yeah. say that, but we just, we just make an observation instead. Okay, for yes, that. yes, yeah, yeah, they would expect that, you know, work life, I mean, everyone expect work-life balance, even employer, no one would want to work on the weekend, but during crisis and emergency and crisis, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's unavoidable. Yeah, it could be the generation gap, but I think like communication plays an important role. Mm -hmm. It's all, up, it's not, it's not about like, you know, using um, law and regu regulations. And it's not just about like using money to convey people. I think like, how you convey the message and the leaders be the role model and convince and influence people to to be on the same board you know that's that's important is this uh, is this uh, is there any cultural issue here Mingui? if you follow our discussion my discussion with kunarisa we talk about in the thai context right that somehow we have a gener generation gap or generation issue in terms of the kind of a, um, uh, the um, devotion, devote themselves to work, work uh, and, um, and and people have to make a kind of a, uh, make, a make a balance between uh, their, 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 their personal life and then and then their work so that Kunarisa uh, just uh, there was something that difficulties both from employees perspective and from employers. And then I'm, I'm kind of uh, looking in another kind of angle that uh, this phenomena happens, uh, do they, do, uh, do, do, uh, does it happen in, in China as well? Uh, I think China is the same, the pressure on this kind of adaptation. 
Yes, actually, if I may compare the situation now, um, if you if you watch the read the news sometimes about China, maybe you can notice that there's a small scale of outbreak of COVID nineteen recently mm. in Xi'an, and then we had a lockdown of the whole city, an overall city for a whole month. Yes. Um, when we're talking about lockdown in Xi'an in China, it's not the same same understanding of, of what we do in Thailand or any other countries. Mm -hmm. When the lockdown level is like complete um, stay in. So all of the people like if from bank to to market, to restaurants, to schools, everyone is like, everything was set in post. Mm -hmm. And um, my my cousin like just told me that they have haven't seen any sunshine for like, a whole month, especially it's a winter time, it's really cold. I'm asking her, how do you keep your morals on? Like, you know, how do you just keep the your yourself in a, a normal level of it, you know, like a human being? And she said that it is the understanding of how many, how many people are sacrificing mm. their own time and own health and own family to set us on a relatively um, safer situation that they don't that they are COVID free. So I think the, the problem is that about so in terms of alignment of the information, I, I really sometimes I got even being as Chinese myself, I, I was surprised and um, by how collectivism we, we are in, in China and how how aligned our our understanding about what the situation is going on is and it's a normal sense that I don't know why that when we when we meet together with Chinese people, we love to talk about the the news, the situation going on around the world, and even just the world news, the so international news. Like in U.S., if we, I I may compare the same time, if you say lockdown, you have to stay at home for a whole month, not coming out. You can imagine what's gonna happen there. So it's I think the cultural differences really make it. Um, Make influence on people. I'm sorry, you're you're muted, Adam. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. I, uh, thank you, thank you. Then I just go back, get back to Gunarisa. Gunarisa, um, after listening to uh, Mingui, um, do you do you have any something more to to say or to uh, remarks? Like in China, is it because of, is there any like, um, I think every country has a gap in generation. Is it also happening in China that the new generation expect different things from the older generation? Yes, I think so. Huh? Yes, yes, of course. Every mm. generation like, have their own needs, but Somehow, it also to my surprise a lot that how the new, I feel like my generation was less, was more rebelling than the new generation that's coming after me because they're in this specific, like this generation, the new generation, I may say that the ones that after 2020. So they are more aligned with, the, because of digitalization, they are more aligned with what's going on in China and the, since the trade war and how much tax has been increased and how it has affected our life, daily life, and how Huawei has been blocked from the international market. So it's sort of like, because of the digitalization, they're more aligned with what's going on in the world. So they would like to give more of themselves to, to, to the organization. Mm. It's, it's funny, right? It, I mean, like, it normally the new ones normally they are the ones that um you know I need more time I need more space but it, in real because uh, before this I was a lecturer in the university I have been keeping con close contact with my uh, previous students mm -hmm. and ask them what's going on with your work even though they're becoming newly new mothers or new fathers they're saying that how much sort of like it surprised me like how much they would like to give to their work. Hmm. Okay. 
I think they are more kind of a global concern, more of global concern. They realize what's happening so around the world and then they uh, find some, uh, they like to have their personal space, personal domain um, in their life. Yeah, well, quite good, quite uh, some uh, new phenomenon though and, and understandable. Okay, um, so that within this context, uh, Ming Hui, well, when it comes to informal learning of uh, of um, of working mothers um, um, in Thailand and in China, do you um, the cultural uh, factors who affect much or what or, or to what extent that you expect that things this kind of thing to 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 become? Um, I have uh, because of informal learning, I had the chance to interview eight um, full time mothers mm -hmm. in Thailand. So, of among all all these eight full time mothers, they are uh, they have international education background, and uh, I would say that. And also, I had contact with the uh, fully Chinese mothers, how they would learn. So it's quite different. In the in Thailand, the culture is more leaning towards a um, happily being a mother, and then. And learning a lot embrace the mother identity, but in China at the same time it's more like embracing both identity as working. It's more like um, more, more linking towards the working mother identity. So, in terms of the uh, using of the facilities to to facilitate the informal learning, I would say that China now is is going really crazy crazily fast about, for example, podcast in Chinese version. It's so popular. If I interview my friends in China, they were like, I, we would compare our work, uh, our hours of listening to the podcast, uh, like uh, audio books. Mm -hmm. For myself, I have like a, a total, the, in the past two years, I have a total of 400 hours of listening. So, which is quite average, not, not low, but um, averagely uh, same as my my in, uh, colleagues before. So the learning you the, the learning we're doing informally is increasing a lot. But in in Thailand, I think also the same because of the YouTube and everything. A lot of we're using different channels. But I'm I what I'm witnessing is that informal learning is really taking a place in our life. Hmm. Okay, um, uh, I do agree that uh, this is quite a kind of a growing uh, phenomenon, okay, uh, for the uh, informal learning through um, many social many social media channels, like you mentioned a podcast, uh, which is uh, something that uh, gives you a kind of a really um, substantial learning. So in many, many subjects, I myself just uh, turn in uh, log in uh, to listening to um, many podcast programs, a um, variety of issues, quite interesting and a good uh, entertainment as well, um, better than listening to music sometimes. Uh, anyway, but, um, but, but uh, for, 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 from this perspective, from this uh, kind of phenomenon, uh, if, we, if we look at, look at this thing from the perspective of, uh, of the management organization, uh, we, we provide them facilities, or we we appreciate that uh, working um, uh, kind of uh, home-based mothers uh, involve themselves in uh, informal learning. And they still um, deliver um, uh, uh, performance to us. How can, how can we provide kind of a, a, a support? Um, as, as we stay far away, we're not see face-to-face -face every day. Um, and how can we extend as a, from organizational perspective? How can we provide a kind of support um, to these uh, um, working mothers and how can we kind of uh, make sure that uh, uh, everyone that still uh, our employees, they realize that they are, they are, treat, uh, they are being treated equally by the organizations, especially in terms of performance evaluation, things like that. Um, 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 could you check with us some of your um, ideas now? Yes, actually I really agree to Kunarisa. She yeah. 
question about art of communication. Uh, as Adam introduced that I, I also have a job as a working part-time as a Chinese customer manager in a hotel. Yeah. So I, I had a chance to interview the general managers of um, uh, the hotel, like yes. how, how, how we went through this, especially in Thailand when the tourism industry has been hit hardly by COVID-19. So yeah. the pull-out phases um, of how we how we hit the break even, and then from that how we pick up the our performance. And so, um, I would say that it was such a hard wall. But um, with art of communication, especially the 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 use of line groups, mm -hmm. that really really did change the whole story. Like because um, I would say that a new hotel uh, on Lancaster, Bangkok, um, at the beginning. I would say like not everyone knows each other, but after COVID nineteen, that um, the situation forced us to to make use of line groups, and people start to chat in the groups, and then they start to become more familiar with each other hmm. compared to before COVID time, yeah. and then this this new uh, term as uh, used by Deloitte, it says the uh, the talent opportunity, the talent market, so. Then we start to get to know better about each other's talents, mm -hmm. and especially for the mothers. So what happens is that people are more of aware of the time time zone of each other, mm -hmm. and so for sometimes the shifts when they cannot attend, they would um uh they would help each other automatically. And also um as the organization is has been providing more support to the, to the employees, for example, the vaccine and the insurance, and even small like uniforms mm -hmm. when, when uh, as, as everyone knows that how much cost, um, like uh, sensitive it is during the COVID-19. And then when the managers realize, oh, that the, the, new, the new generation they require, for example, that when they work in the gym, they require a new uh, uniform and they, the, the, the manager tried so hard to get it for them. And then that really changed, small things like this changes the game. And mm. it makes the employees feel more belong to the hotel and that they feel like they're they're secure with this place. So when um, I remember I, after, the, after the interview, I had a presentation with the, one of the class. So uh, the general manager said that um, after COVID our, our staffs, are more proactive and more coordinated and more engaged where, with our hotel. One of the reasons I suppose is they feel safe with our hotel. We did not lay off anyone because of the COVID. So that was the uh, before the fifth wave. Hmm. Okay, it's, it's such a good example of uh, um, your hotel that you're working with. Um, they have uh, really generous and they, um, uh, extend every 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 means that they can do to to hold their employees together. Um, so that waiting for um, uh, rising sun, then when it comes, uh, when the new when the new sun, when the when the sun comes up in the next morning, they, will, uh, they get ready to go. Okay, but uh, but another point that uh, before I get uh, turn to Kunegabur, I like to ask you, um, Kun Mingwe, that um, to me as a as a layman. Uh, when listening to um, your presentation, that uh, self-informal uh, learning of uh, of um, home-based mothers or um, um, economic mothers who, who have many things to do at home, including work and including uh, other kind of uh, household choirs, then it's somehow I'm, I'm concerned about psychological wellness. Um, the because people we are human. Um, we need in, in, in social interaction. Even though we stay in, in a house at home, we have our, our um, I mean, uh, family members, right? To talk all day long. But uh, we, we kind of, uh, we miss something. If we go to work every day, we, we will find our boss, our friends, our customers, everything. And, and we hear other stories, which is much sometimes um, much serious, uh, more serious than ours. Then so we forgot uh, our problems, right? And but but now everyone 
every um, work mothers, almost every every work working mothers stay home and using this kind of uh, uh, social media to contact and and then self uh, learning, informal learning. Do you do you think that uh, this kind of uh, kind of a uh, um, um, stressful or um, psychological problem happens to um, um, home-based mothers at all? Definitely, definitely. Yeah. As uh, my, my own experience and also my experience with my friends, I would say that the psychological mm. health has been such a import, important phenomena that for, for this time period. Even, okay, before COVID time, it was a matter of choice that whether you choose to stay home or you want to go to work. But yeah. after COVID, it's a matter of like, you just have to do it. Mm. You have to deal with it. Okay. So at the beginning, it was such a, I, I would feel such a resistance and chaos at home that all of us were, were lost of the directions that disorientated mm. because of the, everything is so new. And then all of a sudden, all of the plan, the travel plan, and you cannot be with your family and all of this connectedness that we're feeling. So I would say that I'm still, I don't, I don't have a full answer to that. I don't know how, yeah. I, I cannot answer to that question fully, but I would say that informal learning by taking part of the learning, especially, I would give an example that um, I've been joining this online course of epistemology. Yes. It's so helpful to myself. I'm not selling the course at all. I'm just saying that being more aware of myself epistemologically, that helps me deal with the problem better. That in a way that is mm. suited for myself. Mm. So not that everyone needs this course, but learning is definitely making these things easier to, to be engaged in. Mm. That you feel like you did something, even you're just at home, you're still doing something. Okay. You're learning. So one day when everything is opening, more open, yeah. and you're out there, you are ready. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. That's a good point. Well, um, you, you just mentioned of uh, the mental health, and Kunegabot in his presentation uh, talking something about what organizations should do for employees. One thing. Uh, really important is to provide the kind of uh, mental health services. Okay, so I like to hear from Hune Kabul. Please um, uh, discuss something more on this issue. That how what is about mental health services? What are they? I'm um, kind of a may, may have a kind of personal uh, counselor, or or you have a, another kind of test or another kind of something of uh, of a, a kind of activities that. That, that people um, need to do together in order to to be um, in a good uh, health, mental health. Uh, could I go, please share with us some uh, of your ideas on this. Yes, um, the idea of the mental health service is um, derived from the um, experience mm -hmm. that the um, employee have been um, encountered as the um, pandemic um, uh, hit the very first wave. All of the employees get scared because they get uh they are get scared of the um fire uh get fired, and also they get scared of losing their job, so they get stressed. And also when the remote uh workplace has been um implementing, not everyone are happy working at home because mm -hmm. uh because home for someone is not a good place for working. There's a lot of you know people in their home and they cannot focus on their working, so they get stressed. So from my experience in my ex company, so the um, company provide the mental health um, um, mental health service, which is um, company gather the person who graduated from the um, psychology field, providing consult for uh, for the employee in the organization. And after this project has launched for a few months, yeah. uh, it turns out that it's very work for employee who get stressed. So they can, you know, contact this mental health, you know, seven days yeah. a week. 
Uh-huh. Good. Okay. Well, quite, quite, quite a good example on that. Okay. And um, as I, if, uh, if you don't mind, I ask uh, something that may be close to your personal life. <laughs> you work with the uh, Thai Airways International, right? And yes. sometimes the companies now um, uh, quit for flying for, for, for some time and now start flying. And then for those employees, for those people who are still working with Thai Airways, how about the, um, their mental health and how the, the company trying to heal them or help them with? Um, uh, could you share with us a good example? If you can, if not, if you don't, uh, if you don't feel uh, you're free. Okay, I'll try. Um, some issue can be exposed, uh, can, be, can be disclosed mm -hmm. um, publicly, but some issue cannot be. So I'll, I will give you some, you know, the... Um, you, can, you can feel free to say, okay? Yeah. With no um, since the airline has been, you know, stopped flying, of mm -hmm. course, all of the employees getting scared, you know, and they are stressful because they are lack of the um, income mm -hmm. and they have they are burden or a, a burden like you have to raising their child they have to pay for the rental everything of course they are get stressed and most of them find a second job which is good for them mm -hmm. and the company are trying to um, engage in this second job services for example they are trying to relocate um, employees to work in other departments which is still operating Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, if you can remember last year, last two years, there was the um, launching of Batongko, which is quite famous yes, in the last yes. year, last two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And those who don't have the second job, they work there every day and they got some money, but not, not much um, money, but just small money. Yes. Of course. But at least they can, you know, they can join the society. Their stress will be relieved because they have the society to talk, to enjoy, and they are, they are able to, um, to doing their job because like um, they are working. For example, the cabin crew, they love to service people. Yes. So when they at the um, uh, Panongkoi shop, they can do service job as well. Mm -hmm. So that's the way the company is trying to help them. Okay, uh, this is really important. The reason I ask you because your your topic of discussion today is about jobs in security, okay, or how to keep your job, uh, have a sustainable job, um, and because jobs means uh, means so much uh, to everyone because it means a self uh, a self dignity, right? If you don't have job to do, somehow your your worth your self worth uh, be, uh, being deteriorating, right? You uh, you cannot be proud of yourself. You just feel that you oh you you feel inferior um, compared to other people. So, so that because of this is a very really important. So that that's why I'm uh, turn to you and ask you to share with us the experience of, at uh, Thai Airways International, but some other organizations as well as as well as I know now that many many companies. Uh, um, it's the, the, the COVID-19 dragged on for two year, two and a half years now, and it's really difficult for many small or middle-sized uh, um, companies to keep their employees, okay? Um, because they don't have enough money, they have to kind of uh, um, to close down their, 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 their enterprise, which is something real bad that uh, um, not only financially, but in terms of psychologically. Um, so that uh, I, I like to kind of uh, um, con give uh, encouragement to those people who are still at work and uh, companies that uh, we have to do something together to thrive, to survive. Okay, and, and today, uh, three of you present the three different angles um, to help organization to thrive, or to survive, and also employees as well. And uh, I think we, we, we spent time for uh, quite considerable and we uh, have learned many important issues and ideas. And we have to um, let us 
just listening to uh, our audience. Um, perhaps some we have some questions or something. Um, I have to ask Kun Thirapat Kun Kao. Do we have some questions, uh, uh, written questions, or something that uh, you can uh, ask our uh, presenters? Kun Kao, you here? Yes. Have, um, now we have no question actually. Question. Wow. It means that uh, we our our presentation are really um, size very clear. No one yes. has a question at all, or, or, or we speak something, uh, we present something that uh, they they don't uh, they don't they don't want to they don't mind or they or what? I I don't know. Um, uh, can we? You have any 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 way to um, to ask people to ask our uh, questions? Because we're doing online, so we can we can see faces of people. Um, who attend our our um, session uh, this morning? Uh, can I add up some something? Just make a We still have time. We still have um, time left. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, as you said, the um, the role of the HR people, including HRD and HRM, are huge mm -hmm. right now and still going on. I think it is time for HR people to become the real um, strategic partner with the company. Yeah. Not just doing administrative job, yes. and also the um, <clears throat> uh, in, in K, uh, they have to um, when whenever I'm uh, sorry when they um, when they become the strategic um, partner with the company to create what we call the, what you call ecological system, mm -hmm. they have to um, communicate and working with other depart uh, departments to create the um, the, the one um, um, society or one um, ecology that really work and happy, trying to be the uh, happy, uh, happy workplace. And whatever they're trying to do, whatever kind of strategy that they, are, that they want to create, they have to do based on the um, employee's well-being. Yeah, I do agree. That's what you just said. Um, I think um, for HR professionals, HR people, now they, they have to kind of uh, work more proactive. They have to act like cheerleaders. You, you, you can see that we have, a, you can see when we have games, where we need cheerleaders, right? Um, people now, I mean, employees now, everyone somehow or another, they are not in, a, uh, in an easy situation. Uh, they worry much about families, about the jobs about this and this and that okay it's time to share up and also it's time to um hr people uh, should work as a kind of a linkage a kind of a bring people together and 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 and, and try to find and, and try to support them or, or or facilitate them um make 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 the employees uh think like entrepreneur okay uh, you, we, we will talk about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are those people who comes up with new ideas and can successfully turn those new ideas into productive actions. This is what, what we need uh, in organization now. Okay, uh, I borrow the term entrepreneur in order to, to, to give you kind of a see picture that now we are in uh, like the army. We have to fight unseen enemies okay we have to be ready we have to we have to think about something out of out of the boxes uh, we have we have to try to do something that we never done before this is a, a, a matter of uh, um, life for all of us uh, in organizations so um, I, I I think um, this is very important of the um, sense of urgency in organization so that we need change and HR people should be a leader of change in organizations. That's what I uh, can uh, expect and I can share and encourage HR people to, to, to uh, make an endeavor to, um, to take on this journey, okay? It's a new road uh, for, to travel for HR people now, uh, especially those in middle size uh, of, uh, scale and small scale organizations. I'm not worried much about people in a huge organization. 
Okay, the large organizations they have all many many facilities and systems already. Uh, but for for those organizations at the size of middle uh, SM, uh, SME, for example, is a uh, uh, like to um, encourage HR people or manager of SMB because of many SMB the manager also serve as HR people as well. I mean, they cannot uh, are luxury enough to hire um, HR people to help them in organization. Okay, now seems that uh, we still don't have any any questions, right, Kung Tao? Yes, Kapatan. No problem. We still ask our self questions along the line, along along our presentation. And I hope that for our uh, audience, for our listeners, um, our discussion uh, this morning is beneficial, it's useful, um, uh, even though we cannot give you all the answers because it's, uh, we, uh, we cannot promise any good answers at all in times of difficulties like this. Um, our point is that we try to raise good questions uh, for us to each of us to trying to find um, our answer that applicable to, uh, to everyone, to our situations, okay? This is an important job for organizations and for employees and for HR people. We should find, uh, learn every day and try to find a practical answer that, uh, that fit to our context, of our work, our job situations. Okay? And I hope that everyone uh, benefit from our discussion this morning. And I'd like to thank you our presentations. I mean, I'm sorry, our presenters. Um, uh, thank you, Kun Arisa, Kun Minghui, and Kun Ekabut. You have done a good job uh, this morning. And, um, and uh, I think that uh, uh, we have done our 150 HRV talk program today. It's quite a successful one. Um, thank you very much for everyone that helped uh, this program. Uh, to go up to this minute, um, and uh, we hope that uh, next time um, for SRE talk, uh, we can uh, you join us and other people who um, at home who are in uh, online now uh, will join us again. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye now. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.